There are two ways to name amines, and they're both acceptable. One of them is really common for small amines, and the essential thing here is that the, the carbon chains on the nitrogen should be really simple. In that case, just by custom, uh, the amine is usually named where the nitrogen atom is the backbone, and the, any carbon chains coming off of it are named as branches. So, for example, here, just this nitrogen atom and any hydrogens on it is the backbone, and it's always named amine. The name of that backbone is always amine. And then any carbon chains coming off of it would be uh, branches. So here we have one, two, three carbons, so prop. And because it's a branch, immediately after that prefix would come a YL. And so this would be called propylamine in this first, simpler way of naming amines. Now this doesn't work all the time, and so there's another way to name amines when these carbon chains that would be branches are really complicated. When the carbon chains are too complicated to be named as branches, instead they're named as part of the backbone. And so this second way is really more like the naming schemes that we've seen before, where the backbone or the parent chain is the longest carbon chain you can find without going backwards or lifting up your pencil, but in this case it just has to contain the functional group, which is the nitrogen. So this whole thing, not just the nitrogen, but the nitrogen with the longest carbon chain, that whole thing is the backbone. And the functional group is named with a suffix, and the suffix here is amine. So here you would number this, you have one, two, three carbons, so the prefix is prop, all single bonds between those carbons, so the infix is an, and it's an amine, so the suffix is amine. The other thing you want to do is to say where the amine attaches to this chain. The nitrogen could be, is here is attaching to carbon 1, but you could just as easily imagine it attaching to carbon 2. It would still be propanamine, but the amine would be attaching to a different place. So you have to say where the amine is attaching. In this case, it's attaching to carbon 1, and so you'd put that in front of the backbone name, and you would have one propanamine. Remember that always between numbers and letters goes a dash. So this molecule can be named in two ways. Both ways are acceptable. Both ways would re receive full points. And both ways are approved by IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. If you have simple chains coming off of the nitrogen, then the carbon chains are named as branches, and the nitrogen, it all by itself, is a backbone named amine, always. If the carbon chains are longer and more complicated, you may want to use a method that works all the time. And in that case, the longest carbon chain that has the functional group on it is the parent chain. You give the prefix for that, based on the number of carbons, the infix based on the bonding, and the suffix here represents amine. And so the suffix is amine. The last thing you want to do is to make sure you say where the nitrogen is attaching onto your carbon chain, and you do that by putting a number at the very front of the name. So propylamine and one propanamine represent the same molecule and are both equally valid here. So sort of armed with that general idea, let's see if we can complete exercise 21.3. We see an amine here, this nitrogen with all single bonds around it, and so uh, we're, we've got it narrowed down to one of those two naming schemes. When you look at the carbon chain that's attached to the nitrogen, it's complicated. It's not just a straight chain. This has branches on it. So it would be inconvenient to treat this branch, to, to treat this carbon chain as a branch. It would be a branch that has branches that's complicated. So in this one, we don't want to use that first naming scheme. The carbon chains are not simple enough. Instead, we're going to use the second one. In this naming scheme, you number the carbon chain. And we're going to number it to give the functional group the lowest number. The amine is more important than the methyl groups. So we're going to number this carbon chain from right to left. The parent chain is the longest carbon chain you can find without going backwards and lifting up your pencil. I like to circle it so that it stands out from the rest of the molecule, the branches. So let's name that parent chain as if it were all by itself and didn't have any branches on it. We have four carbons. The prefix for four carbons is bute. We have all single bonds between them. 
the infix for that is an. The functional group we have is amine, and so the suffix is amine. So this is butanamine. One other thing, we have to say where the amine is attaching. Here it's attached to carbon number one, so this will be one butanamine. So much for the backbone. Now we have to name the branches. We have two branches. Both of them are attached to carbon number three. So we'll have three and a dash, three and a dash. In this first branch, there's only one carbon there. The prefix for one carbon is meth. And to show that it's a branch, immediately after the prefix comes yl. In the other branch, there's only one carbon. So the prefix for one carbon is meth. And to show that it's a branch, immediately after that comes yl. Because we have two branches that are the same type of branch, they're both methyl branches, we can combine those. And together, they would be called 3, 3. So you separate the numbers with commas. Always between numbers and letters goes a dash. And don't forget to put a prefix that says how many of these branches we are smushing together. So here, we're smushing two together, and so we get this prefix di. And then just say what type of branch. So what we smushed together were methyl branches. We can take the branch name, the branch names, and put it in front of the backbone name, always in between letters and numbers goes a dash, and the full name for that compound would be 3,3-dimethyl-1-butanamine. Okay, now let's go to B. Let's try this one. Now in this case, the branch is not complicated. The branch that we have does not have any other branches on it. And so we can name this both ways. First, let's try to name it the simpler way. In the simple way, the nitrogen atom with any hydrogens attached to it, that all by itself is the backbone, and the name for that backbone is amine. The carbon chain is named as a branch. Now here we can see that the carbon chain is going in a ring, and the prefix for that is cyclo, that says going in a ring. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons here. The prefix for five carbons is pent. And because this is a branch, immediately after that prefix for the number of carbons comes YL. So cyclopentyl would be the name of that branch. And in that first simpler way of naming, the name for this amine would be cyclopentyl amine. So that's possible here because the carbon branch doesn't have any branches on it. So that's the first way. But let's also try to name this the second way for practice. In the second way, the carbon chain, the longest carbon chain that you can find without going backwards or lifting up your pencil, is part of the backbone. And so you would name it. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons here. That backbone is going in a ring, so cyclo. Five carbons, so pent. In between those carbons, you have all single bonds, so the infix is an. And we have a functional group here. The functional group is amine. Because this is a ring, and it only has one branch on it, putting that branch on any position is the same. If the, if the NH2 were on this carbon instead, it would be ha like having this molecule and just rotating it a little bit. And so because you only have this one branch off of this ring, you don't have to say where it is. So you wouldn't put a one here. It would be redundant. No matter where you put it, that position will become carbon number one. And so the name for this, in the second acceptable IUPAC way of naming this, would be cyclopentanamine. So both of these names would be acceptable. OK, let's try C. In this case, when you look at the carbon chains, none of the carbon chains have branches coming off of them. And so they're all simple, and we could name this in that first, simpler way of naming. The second, more complicated way of naming, is can be used all the time. And so this molecule can be named through either method. For practice, let's use both. So first, the simpler way. With the way, the way to name simple amines, the nitrogen by itself, along with any hydrogens that may be on it, is the backbone. And the name for that backbone is always amine. Any carbon chains on it, those are named as branches. So for example, at the bottom right here, we have a branch with just one carbon on it. 
The prefix for one carbon is meth, and because it's being treated as a branch, immediately after that you'll have YL. Notice that we don't have to put a number for where this is attaching, because our backbone is only one atom, so there's only one place for it to attach. In the top right, we have another branch, there's only one carbon on it, the prefix for one carbon is meth, and because it's a branch, immediately after that comes YL. To the left of the nitrogen, we have another branch. It's a ring, so we'd put the prefix cyclo. The ring has one, two, three, four, five carbons, so the prefix is pent. And because we're treating this as a branch off of our nitrogen backbone, immediately after the prefix for the number of carbons comes YL. Now here, we're going to alphabetize these. The cyclopentyl starts with a C. Methyl starts with an M. The other methyl also starts with an M. Before we do this, we might actually combine these two branches. These branches are the same type of branch, and so we can smush them together. We always, you always want to say how many of the branches you're smushing together. Here we're going to smush two together, so we'll use the prefix di, and the type of branch that we're smushing together is a methyl branch. Okay, so really, in terms of branches, we have cyclopentyl and dimethyl. Now, we want to put these in front of the backbone name, and when you do that, you want to alphabetize them. You alphabetize them based on the first letter that comes in the, in the branch name. If you ever have a, a, a hyphen in the branch name, so for example, if you had tert butyl, you start alphabetizing after the hyphen. But if you don't have a hyphen, like here, then the first letter is where you start alphabetizing. So we're going to be comparing the C in cyclopentyl with the M in methyl. Now, these prefixes that tell you how many of the branches you smush together are not used for alphabetizing. So C comes before M, and so the branch that starts with a C comes before the branch that starts with an M. Both of those come before the backbone name. So the in the first way of naming, the name for this molecule would be cyclopentyl dimethyl amine. So that's the first way of naming. Now let's think about the second way of naming. In the second way of naming, your longest carbon chain, the longest carbon chain you can find without going backwards or lifting up your pencil, is going to be your backbone. And here, that is this five carbon ring. So you want to have the five carbon ring and the nitrogen as part of your backbone. Where the nitrogen attaches, that's one. So one, two, three, four, five. Our backbone is, is a ring, so we'll have the prefix cyclo. You have five carbons, so that's represented by pent. Then there are all single bonds in that carbon chain, so the infix is AN. And, bec and because we have a nitrogen with all single bonds around it, the functional group is an amine, and the suffix for amines is amine. So cyclopentanamine is the name for the backbone in this molecule. You don't have to give a number for where the nitrogen is attaching because there's only one branch on this ring. So wherever that branch attaches, that's carbon number one. So it's understood that the branch will be on carbon number one, and you don't have to state it explicitly in the name. It would be redundant information. We do still have two branches, though, and these are coming off of the nitrogen. Now, normally when you have branches, you want to give numbers to say where the branches are attaching. Here, though, the branches are not attaching to the numbered carbons in the backbone. Instead, they're attaching to the nitrogen. And so instead of numbers, these branches are going to be given capital N's to say their location. And the capital N's are going to function sort of like numbers. So after them, you'll have the dash. So they're, be they're locants. They're giving you the location of the branch. It's attached to the capital N nitrogen. In this first branch in the top right, there's only one carbon there, and so the prefix for one carbon is meth. Because it's a branch, immediately after that carbon prefix comes YL. At the bottom right, you have another branch with just one carbon. The prefix for one carbon is meth, and because it's a branch, immediately after the carbon prefix comes YL. 
we have two branches that are the same type of branch. They're both methyl branches, and so we can smush them together. We can take the locations of them, they're both capital N's, separate those by commas as if those were numbers, always between the locants, so, which are usually numbers, and the branch name goes a dash. And then you want to say, use a prefix to say how many branches you're smushing together. This is one br methyl branch that we'll smush together, a second special br methyl branch that we're smushing together, so we'll use the prefix di. And the type of branch that we're smushing together are methyl branches. So together, these two branches would be called NN-dimethyl. Okay. So those are the two branches coming off of this backbone, and we just want to put those branch names in front of the backbone names. So I'm going to put this down here where there's a little more room. Putting the branch names in front of the backbone names, we have NN-dimethylcyclopentanamine. And so both of these ways of naming are completely correct and acceptable. You could have cyclopentyldimethylamine, or you could call the molecule NN-dimethylcyclopentanamine. Both would be accepted by the rules established by IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Okay, let's try D. Now in D, when you see the nitrogen with all single bonds, and so you'd say, hmm, this is an amine. And when you look at the branches attached to the nitrogen, they're all simple. And what I mean by that is none of those branches have other branches coming off of them. And so you can name this molecule according to that first simpler method. Of course, you can name any amine according to the second method. So let's name this both ways so that we have more practice in naming these amines. In the first way, the nitrogen atom all by itself, along with any hydrogens on it, is the backbone, and the name for that backbone is amine, always. Any carbon branches are branches. So these car any carbon chains are branches. So to the left you have two carbons, the prefix for two carbons is eth, and because it's being, going to be treated as a branch, immediately after that carbon prefix comes YL. In the bottom, we have two carbons, that carbon chain, so the prefix is F, and that's going to be named as a branch coming off of our ba amine backbone. To the right, we have two carbons, and so the prefix will be F, and because we're going to treat that as a branch, immediately after that prefix comes YL. So each of those would be ethyl branches. And notice that we don't have to give a name or a locant. We don't have to say give a capital N, N, for example, to say where those branches are, because our backbone is only one atom. There's only one place for them to connect to the backbone in this way of naming. So we have three branches that are the same type of branch. All three of these are ethyl branches. So we can smush them together. You want to use a prefix to say how many branches you're smushing together. Here we have one, two, three. So we'll use the prefix tri. And then you want to say what type of branch you're smushing together. These are ethyl branches. Make sure you put those branch names in front of the backbone name. And overall, according to the first way of naming, this would be called triethyl amine. Okay. Let's try to name that same molecule, but using the second method, the method that works all the time, no matter how complicated branches are. In this one, find the longest carbon chain that's going to be part of the backbone with the functional group. So here, the longest carbon chain I can find without going backwards or lifting up my pencil is two carbons long. And so I'm going to circle that. It ties. It doesn't matter which one of these I use. They're all two carbons long. So I could circle any of these. You'll end up with the same name no matter which one you use. I'm going to use this one on the left. That's going to be my backbone. And the nitrogen that's attached to it will be the functional group on that backbone. Because I have two carbons, the prefix for the backbone will be F. There are all single bonds between those carbons. So the infix is AN. And because we have a nitrogen with all single bonds, the suffix is amine. So the name for that backbone would be ethanamine. 
Now here again, you wouldn't give a number to say where the nitrogen attaches. This is kind of an exception in that sense. Because no matter which carbon the nitrogen attaches to, that would be carbon number one. In an ethane molecule, both carbons are symmetrical. The molecule is symmetrical, so both carbons would be the same. And so you don't have to say where the nitrogen will attach. If you take this nitrogen in a group and attach it to the other carbon, well, it's just like having this, this molecule, but sort of rotating it. And so you don't have to give a number to say where the nitrogen attaches. The name for this backbone is just ethanamine. We do have branches, but the branches are coming off of the nitrogen. So we give the locant capital N. And we treat that sort of as a number, saying where the branch attaches. Each of these branches has two carbons. The prefix for two carbons is eth. And because these are branches, immediately after the carbon prefix comes yl. So these are both n-ethyl branches. Because they're the same type of branch, we can smoosh them together. We have one, two branches that we'll be smooshing together, so you want to use a prefix that says how many branches you're smooshing together. Because we're smooshing two, it's di. You want to give the numbers or the locants for where these are attaching. That actually comes first. So you have n comma n and then a dash. These are acting like the numbers saying where the branches are attaching. We're attaching two branches, so we have the prefix di. And then you want to name the type of branch. And here, they're both ethyl branches. So the names for these branches together would be n n di ethyl. Take the, the branch names, put it in front of the backbone name, and the full name for the molecule, according to the second way of naming, would be n n diethyl ethanamine. So you can see that if you have the choice, it's easier to use the first method. But the first method only works if the branches are simple. And therefore, it's useful to know the second method of naming, because that works all the time. So this molecule could either be called triethylamine or nn diethyl ethanamine. Both of those would be acceptable according to IUPAC. Okay, let's try E. So in E, the carbon chain that's attached to the amine, and you'd look at this and first see a nitrogen with all single bonds, so you'd say, okay, this is an amine. The carbon chain attached to that has a branch coming off of it, so it's complicated. Because this carbon chain has a branch on it, you cannot name it according to the first system of naming. You have to use the second system of naming. And so here, you want to find the carbon chain, the longest carbon chain you can find without going backwards or lifting up your pencil, that has the amine on it. And it's this six-membered ring. Remember that whenever you have rings and straight chains, you always separate them in your mind. You can count the ring, you can count the straight chain, but you would never cross them when you're counting one. So they're always separate in your mind. Okay, so here, our longest backbone, the one that has the amine on it, is this six-membered ring. It's a ring, and so we say cyclo. It has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons on it, so the prefix is hex. All of those carbons have single bonds between them, so the infix is an. And the functional group we have is an amine, so the suffix is amine. Cyclohexanamine would be for the name for this molecule. Now we don't have to give the number one for where the amine is. The amine is the most important thing on this ring, and so by default it will be carbon number one. So it would be redundant information to say one hexanamine, wherever we put the nitrogen, it will be carbon one. We do have a branch. The branch is coming off of carbon number three. So we'll have three and then a dash. The type of carbon branch that this is is an isopropyl branch. That's one of those um, branches that have branches whose common names you would have learned in Organic Chemistry 1. There are several of those, and if you'd like a review for those, I have a video that I made for Organic Chemistry 1 that goes over the different unusual branch names that you'd want to know. You should definitely know isopropyl, isobutyl, tert-butyl, and tert-butyl 4 at this point in the class. So here we have 3-isopropyl, that's a branch name. 
we can put our branch name in front of our backbone name. And at first, our first draft of the name is 3-isopropyl cyclohexanamine. Now, the reason why that's not our final name, the flashing lights that should put you on warning, are the solid wedges. Those solid wedges, those solid wedges represent the three-dimensional orientation of those bonds. Remember that the solid wedge means that a bond is coming out at you. And a dashed wedge means that a bond is going away from you. Now, those three-dimensional orientations are most important when you have a chiral center. And so whenever you see those types of bonds, either solid wedges or dashed wedges, you want to check to see if you have a chiral center on the atom with that bond. So let's zoom in here and, and investigate that. A chiral center is an atom that ha that's bonded to four different groups. Not four different atoms, but four different groups. If it's bonded to four different groups, then it's handed. Like your hand, it comes in two versions. Your hand also has four sides, the back of your hand, the palm of your hand, the thumb side of your hand, the pinky side of your hand, and your hand comes in two versions, a right and a left version, so right and left hands. And they're different. As similar as they look, they're different, and you can prove that by trying to put your right hand into a left-handed glove. It doesn't fit. In the same way, a right or left-handed atom, or say a right-handed atom, won't fit into a left-handed enzyme pocket. As chemists who want to be able to predict the behavior of molecules, we want to know the pockets that things will fit into, and so we want to know what type of hand we have. The right hand is called an R chiral center, and the left hand is called an S chiral center. So if we are trying to figure out whether that's a chiral center, the first thing to do is to figure out whether that carbon atom is bonded to four different things. To help with this, it's useful to draw the fourth atom in. We only see three bonds here. The fourth bond is an implied bond to a hydrogen, and that would be with a dash. In a tetrahedral atom like carbon, two bonds will always be in the plane, one will be coming out at you, and one will be going away. If you already have two bonds in the plane and one coming out at you drawn, then the fourth one must be going away. So here, you, you, the first step to, in, in assigning whether this is R or S is to assign priorities based on the atomic number of the elements. Remember, the atomic number is the number on top of the box of the periodic table. So the number for nitrogen is 7, which is higher than carbon. So this has the highest priority. Hydrogen is 1. That has the lowest priority, and these two carbon atoms tie. They're both six. Whenever atoms tie, you make a table. So here I'll make a tar table for the carbon on the left and a table for the carbon at going down. And you want to list the atoms that these carbons are bonded to going away from the chiral center. And going back toward the chiral center, they're bonded to the same thing. So going away from the chiral center, this carbon on the left is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. And I'm going to put those in this table in, descending, in order of descending atomic numbers, so carbon and two hydrogens. This one going down, going away from the chiral center, is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. And I'll put that in my table in, descent, in order of descending atomic number, so carbon first and then the two hydrogens. Now when, once you have the tables, you compare the atoms one row at a time. So just look at the top row, not at the whole table. Only if those tie would you go to the second row. Only if those tie would you go to the third row. All three of these rows tie. So we go to the next carbons, or the next atoms, in this chain. Those are both carbons again. And so they tie again. And so we make tables again. One table for the carbon on the left, one table for the carbon below. Going away from the chiral center, the carbon on the left is bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So that's this carbon here. Below, that carbon is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. So I put those in order of descending atomic number. 
Once I have the table for each of those, I compare them one row at a time. Only if a row ties do I go to the next row down. The top row ties, so I go to the second row. And here, the carbon in the top carbon, or the, the atom in the top carbon has a higher atomic number than the atom in the lower carbon. And so, this carbon here in that direction has a higher priority than the carbon or the group in the other direction. Okay, it's worthwhile noting also that the atom we were interested in is bonded to four different groups. It's bonded to an amine, it's bonded to a hydrogen, it's bonded to a carbon chain that doesn't have branches for a while, and it's bonded to a carbon chain that has branches relatively soon. So it's bonded to four different things, and so it's chiral. Now we just assign priorities to each of those different groups. Once you have those, check to make sure that number four is going away, and it is. We can discuss what happens to what happens if it's not going away, if that arises in one of these exercises. But if it's going away, then ignore number four and go from one to two to three. If you're going counterclockwise, then the chiral center is S. And you could remember that because as you go from the top to the bottom of an S, you have to go counterclockwise. If it were going the other way, clockwise, then it would be R. And you can remember that because going from the top to the bottom of an R, you have to go clockwise. But here it's counterclockwise, and so that chiral center is S. Now, if you remember, that carbon, that atom, the atom where that chiral center is, was carbon number one. And you always put the stereochemistry at the very beginning of the name in parentheses. On carbon number one, we had an S chiral center. Now, we have another place that looks like it might be a chiral center, but we know because it has that solid wedge of a bond. That three-dimensional bond is important to tell the difference between the right and left-hand version of an atom. And so usually if it's included, it's a chiral center. You can verify it. You have a, a carbon chain that with a branch relatively soon on one side, carbon chain with a branch not soon on the other side, an isopropyl group, that's a third thing, and the fourth thing is a hydrogen that's implied there. Only three bonds are drawn in, the fourth bond has to be a hydrogen. Notice that the hydrogen has to be going away because this carbon is tetrahedral. Two bonds are already drawn in the plane, one coming out, and so the last one has to be going away. Okay, so now that we know that's a chiral center, we need to assign priorities to these different groups. We have a carbon, a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. Well, we know the hydrogen, at least, is the least, has the lowest atomic number and therefore the lowest priority. The rest of these tie, and so we'll need to make a table for each one. We'll make a carbon, a table for the carbon on the left, for the carbon above, and the carbon going below. Okay, first to the left. This carbon is bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So carbon, carbon, and hydrogen. Okay, now above, this carbon is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. And finally, below, that carbon is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. So those are our three carbons. Once you have the tables, compare the tables one row at a time. So carbon, carbon, carbon. Only if they tie, which they do here, would you go to the second row. So we have hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Carbon has the highest atomic number of those three, and so this isopropyl group gets the highest priority. That is priority number one. Okay, I'm going to erase this now that we have that so that it doesn't clutter our image here. If we go to the next row, for these last two that tied, they tie again. Because they tie again, 
we go to the next carbons in the chain. So these two. They're both carbons, so we make a table again. This carbon below is bonded to a carbon and two hydrogens. Carbon, two hydrogens. The carbon above is bonded to a nitrogen, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. And we, when we compare those tables, the nitrogen has a higher atomic number than the carbon. And so the branch in that direction has a higher priority than the branch in the other direction. Okay. Now, oops, so this is three. So once you have the priorities, make sure that four is going away. It is. Then go from one to two to three. If it's clockwise, like it is here, then it's a right-handed version of the molecule. And you can remember that because as you go from the top to the bottom of an R, you go clockwise. And so this is an R, or a right-handed chiral center. Now remember that that chiral center was on carbon number three. Our carbons were one, two, three, four, five, six. This was on carbon number three. And so this will be three R. The stereochemistry always goes in the very front of the name, inside of parentheses. They're separated by commas, and you only put a number in front of the letter if you have more than one chiral center. So the full name for the full beautiful artistically chiseled name for this molecule, a name that you might consider giving to your children if they're lucky, is 1S3R, 3-isopropyl cyclohexanamine. Okay, last one. Let's check out F. Now in F, F is interesting. We have a carbon chain, and there is something coming off of it. So you might see the amine at first and think, hmm, amine, there's those two ways to name it. You have a carbon chain, but there's something coming off of it, so we can only name it in the second way, not in the first way. But when you look a little closer, you notice that the second thing is another functional group. We have an alcohol and an amine. Now normally, each of those functional groups would define the molecule. In this case, where you have both, which one is the most important? Which one determines the, the suffix in the name? And which one is the branch? IUPAC has come up with a list of the highest to lowest priority functional groups. And this is mostly just conventional, but it does have a little bit to do with the reactivity of the molecules, of the functional groups. Now, as you go down this, the highest priority gets the lowest number and gets the suffix in the name. And so whichever one is higher up in this list is the one that gets the carbon number one and is represented in the suffix of the name. You could see that it, the alcohol is higher than an amine. This has a higher priority according to these, this convention that IUPAC has agreed on. And so the oxygen is really, the OH in the alcohol, is really the backbone, and this nitrogen will be a branch. When an amine is a branch, it's called an amino branch, just like the amines are branches off of carboxylic acids, and that makes amino acids. So this is our backbone here, this circled group. Now we have six carbons here, one, two, three, four, five, six. They're in a ring, so we have cyclo, six carbons is hex, all single bonds between the carbons, so A-N, and because it's an alcohol, the suffix is O-L, so cyclohexanol. We do have a branch, it's coming off of carbon number three. Oh, and I should say, you don't have to say what carbon the, the OH is coming off of, because whichever one it's coming off of, because it's the most important branch, that will be carbon number one. So it would be redundant to put a one in front of this. You wouldn't do that. You know that because it's in the suffix, wherever it is, is carbon number one. We do have a branch that's coming off of carbon number three. Always between numbers and letters goes a dash. We talked about how when amines are branches, they're called amino branches. So we have a three amino branch coming off of our cyclohexanol backbone. So the backbone for this is three amino cyclohexanol. Now, when we look at this a little more carefully, 
you'll notice that you have those solid wedge and dashed wedge bonds that give us the three-dimensional orientation of those groups. And that means that these are probably chiral centers. Now, because we walked through this so carefully in the last example, I'm going to do this kind of fast. The procedure for figuring out these things that I'm going to write down are the same, would be the same as what we went through in the last exercise. So first, this molecule on the right. Notice that the only three bonds are drawn. The fourth bond has to be to an implied hydrogen, and it has to be coming out at us because we already have two bonds in the plane and one going away, and the carbon is tetrahedral. The hydrogen is carbon number four. Oxygen is priority one. These two carbons tie, but when you go to the next one, this one has a nitrogen on it, so it has a higher priority than the carbon below. So this is two, and this is three. Now I would encourage you, if that doesn't make sense, to draw out the tables like we did in the last example. And if you don't, uh, if you don't get two and three, then email me, contact me. I'd be happy to work through you through it with you. Now here, the se the second step is to make sure four is going away. It's not. So now we get to talk about what to do. You still go from one to two to three. Here that's clockwise, and you would think it would be R, but. 4 is coming out at us, so we switch it and it's actually S. So if 4 is coming out at you, you go through the same steps, but you switch the, what you get. Now remember, this was at carbon number 1, so we're going to have parentheses way out in front, and on carbon number 1, we'll have an S, a left-handed atom. Okay, so much for that chiral center. Now let's think about the other chiral center, this one. The nitrogen has the highest atomic number, so that's a one. There's a hydrogen here. Notice that it must be going away because we already have two bonds in the plane and one coming out at us. So for a tetrahedral atom, the next one would have to be going away. The hydrogen is priority number four. The two carbons technically tie, so you'd go to the next two. This one has an oxygen on it, and so that has a higher priority than the other branch. Now, that's the first step, assigning priority. Second step, make sure four is going away. It is. So you'd go from one to two to three. That's counterclockwise. And let me actually do that like this. One to two to three. That's counterclockwise. And so it's S. Now remember, this was carbon one, two, three. On carbon three, we also have an S. Between that parenthesis and a number always goes a dash. And so the full name for this compound would be 1S3S3-aminocyclohexanol. So I went through the chiral configuration there a little faster because we spent a lot of detail on it in the previous video, or in the previous exercise. If you want more practice with that, I have a whole bunch of videos practicing that from Organic Chemistry 1, and I'd be delighted to send them to you. What we saw new in F was that these amines have a relatively low priority. They're lower than an alcohol. In fact, they're lower than most things, most of the functional groups. And so if you have another functional group, chances are the other functional group will be the carbon number one, and will be represented in the suffix, and the amine will be a branch. When an amine is a branch, it's called an amino branch. So hopefully this video gave you some practice on naming amines in both ways of naming. And in the next video, we'll work with naming again, but starting with the name, 